I'd like to introduce to you first Victor Schantz, who is uh, the president of our company and the, the fourth generation of his family to be involved in this business. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd just like to say welcome to you. I know you're going to enjoy this tour because we're talking about something that a combination of many different sciences and art forms in one musical instrument. To go through the shop and see folks working at that craft is an interesting thing to do. Learn everything you can about how this instrument goes together and how it can enhance worship at your church. Many pipe organs that up until about the middle of the 1920s were done from uh, sugar pine. Sugar pine was very plentiful at that time in, in America. It's a little more difficult to get it now. We have gotten our yellow poplar from the same source for over 50 years. We take great uh, B and C lumber to make furniture. We take great A lumber to build pipe organs because that is such an important part of the natural material in our process and we're very concerned and very particular about the wood that we get. That kind of wood, we match whatever interior wood is present in the building that we're working in. So that may be some variety of oak or maple or cherry or mahogany or walnut and all those styles and species of wood are located back here too. Uh, one thing that you'll notice as we walk through the, this portion of the building, there's a real wonderful aroma about being in a wood shop and there's a sense of something that's so that, that's the bonus that you get. And we'll get, we'll get to lacquer a little bit later, which is another bonus, but in a different way. We have a finished room upstairs of the cabinet work in the organ, the console case, any of the organ case components, the bench, that sort of thing. The cabinet grade finishing is done upstairs. In the pipe shop, there's also a finished booth for pipe work or any kind of metal work that we do as well. What you see behind you there is a box that is a blower box. Inside that, we'll do an organ blower. And one of the things that we build here in-house, in addition to the pipe organ, is the blower to generate the wind. We have a subsidiary of the Sean's Organ Company known as the Zephyr Electric Organ Blower Company. It was founded in 1909. And we sell blowers to pipe organ builders all over the country, as a matter of fact, all over the world, in addition to making blowers for our own consumption. Simulate that volume control is to put a set of shades in front of it and close the shades. So it sounds like it's getting louder, even though it's not really getting louder. And those shades, or, or what we call expression shades, are operated by a big pneumatic device called the swelling. There are eight individual pneumatics in there. There's enough power and torque there that you can, if you pro properly hook it up, you can literally almost pull down the side of the building. The stoppers, which you see at the ends of the pipes here, which actually help to tune the pipe, it's like a plunger, if you will, and it affects the amount of pipe that's actually vibrating in the pitch that it's actually producing. And that stopper has a leather uh, fitting over the end of it that helps it slide up and down in the pipe. Not a console, there are wind, all kinds of wind chests. And we'll, we'll see that down in the voicing department. There's actually a small pipe organ down there. That organ will be being assembled in the, in the assembly room here. And as we get big organs, yeah, as we get big organs in here, sometimes at night we'll even leave the lights on because people like to drive by and see these great big pipe organs. <laughs> We don't play them here. And you think, that's kind of odd, isn't it? You, you make musical instruments, you mean you don't play them here? We, we voice each individual set of pipes. We test each individual wind chest. We test the console and all its components. But the step of putting all that together here and winding it and wiring it really is an unnecessary step for us. We're absolutely confident that these will play. Yeah, this is the pouch board department. <laughs> and this is Holly, who's the chief of the pouch boards. And this is the mechanism, or the portion of the mechanism, that actually makes the wind chest work. Every one of these little pouches represents what? A pipe, a note, absolutely right. And these are all hand right here. And what these do, as the organist presses a key, the atmospheric air inside this pouch collapses, the pouch collapses, and the pressurized air in the wind chest is allowed to go up into the pipe and make the pipe play. These elements come out without disassembling the rest of the organ. So you drop the bottom board, you go in there, you take the pouch board down, you send it back, you have to rebuild, you come back, put it in, done. It's not disassemble the whole organ first. Now that's something Shantz has been doing since the 1940s. The organ portions are uh, computer rendering, and then the photograph is, is an actual photograph from, uh, from the room. Who was the great 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 grandfather of Father Valencheck? <laughs> he was a monk in France in a specific order. And, uh, the, the whole uh, the whole concept of pipe organ metal and spotted metal for organ pipes was developed by a monk in France about 500 years ago, 
when metal was cast on sand rather than on granite as it is today. Tin and lead, and we combine those two uh, basic elements together in the cauldron over here, down the length of this table. As it draws down the length of the table, it deposits a thin layer of molten metal on this table. This table is solid granite covered with canvas. Is that it, it actually draws the heat out of that molten metal very quickly. So quickly, in fact, that after you've cast a sheet of metal, about five minutes after that, you can actually pick it up and actually move it and work with it at that point. Seventy percent of the organs pipes are made from some form of spotted metal. This and it came from the fact that the lead and tin cools at a slightly different rate. And what that gum arabic does is simply protects this metal in the manufacturing process. And you say, well, what? Why green and pink? Is that just what you? That's the color of the day. The, re the reason they're different colors is so that immediately upon sight, the pipe maker can tell whether he's he or she's working with the inside of the metal or the outside of the metal. It protects that metal in the manufacturing process. And when we're all done, all the pipes go to a wash tank in the head of our pipe shop. Neil Jackson's up at the front of the room, right there at the pipe shop, right now. And that comes off with good old-fashioned soap, water, and apple grease. They're nearly ready to go out to the tonal department and be voiced. And you can see it still has a little bit of that gum arabic on here. It's protected that as that seam was fabricated. You can see these spotted metal pipes. The spots are a little bit easier to see in this pipe of this scale. Uh, in addition to being washed, then eventually a, a cast lead toe will go on the bottom of this pipe. One other step is that there will be some kind of tuning device put on this pipe. A pipe's pitch is determined by its length. This is fun, guys. This is the tonal department. This is, uh, this is where uh, voicing of organ pipes happens. And what happens is after the pipes come out from the pipe shop, they're, they're brought to this department and two things happen. The first thing that happens is that they are what we call prepared to speak and prepared to be. Uh, in the case of brand new pipes, really not speaking at all. They may sort of try to make a sound, but they really haven't made much of a musical sound yet. So the, uh, the job of the voicer is then to direct that air sheet by manipulating the languid and the flu, which is the width between the languid and the lower lip of the pipe. We can modify how that air sheet is striking. We want it to come up and bisect the upper lip so that it sets all of the air in the column, in this column here, into resonance. That's what's going to produce our tone. <coughs> so the voicer's job is to direct that air sheet. And he's got a couple of different things and techniques that he can do. This is Jeff Hurt, who's the head of our, our tonal department here. Almost plays by itself. But one plus one equals about four here. Because you're actually, you, you intentionally set the, uh, the pipes just slightly out of tune. Sounds very accordion-like. Yeah. yeah Why do they use white metal? Again, it's it, in this instance, it's it, it's as much for timbre as anything else. It, sometimes we'll use uh, well, sometimes we'll use metal with more tin in it for a visual thing if we want to present a particular visual uh, aspect. Most often, it's done to change the timbre or vowel color on the set of pipes. Mm -hmm. One of two in the shop, and uh, we talked a little bit in the in the pipe shop about how. The, the two different styles of pipes make their sound. This is the business end of a reed pipe right here. This is a lead block, which we cast here, into which a shallot is pointed, put. Now, shallot looks strangely like shallots that you would cook with, and uh, actually, if you look at them in prospect, and in cross section, they're very similar in construction. It's a hollowed out brass tube, and what happens is then you see this thin brass tongue that's applied to that, that's actually how this thing makes its sound. It vibrates back many, many thousand times a second. And it's taking that sound wave and pushing it through the shallot, through the block, up and back of the machine. You can see the variety of different ways in which you can resonate a reed stone. Everything from fractional length pipes and things that look like little toadstools and mushrooms to uh, <laughs> orchestral style trumpets with a, with a uh, flared bell on the end of it. And everything in between.